Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. And before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Victoria Motor on the podcast. She's a nationally qualified MPC wellness competitor coming to us all the way from Pennsylvania, where, I mean, I hope the weather might be a little bit better than it is here. But knowing that, I mean, we are both in the northern states now, and she just recently moved back there. So she's getting a little too, a little too familiar with the cold now, which, I mean, I have guests on from the South, and I was like, you lucky SOBs, because they're talking like, oh, it's, it's so chilly, it's 65 degrees, and I was like, good God. But before I get into that, she's our most current guest, so Victoria, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, I really appreciate it. Well, I gotta ask first of all, because I love to torture myself, what is the weather like in Pennsylvania today? It is probably low 40s, not too bad, because um, at least the sun's out. You know, Pittsburgh has a lot of gray days, so if it's not gray, I think we're we're in a good spot. I have actually been to Pittsburgh once. We did a trip. I don't know if you can see back there, but I have my rally monkeys from all the MLB stadiums that I went to because my family is huge baseball fans. So we went to Pittsburgh. I was so surprised how it's like, it's just surrounded by hills. It was scary for me at oh, first, yeah. like going down there and you're like, oh my God, like, what is this? And you're like, geez, this is just, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. But I enjoyed it though. That was one of my favorite ballparks to go to. But yeah, I mean, it's snowing here in Minnesota. Surprise, surprise. That's just like, you know, it's it's every day now where it's going to be about 10 degrees for the rest of the... Although we'll get to the negative 20s probably in, in late January where, you know, that's a fun time to go out. I literally... So the screen that you have in your car that like you look up and you see what's behind you, it froze last night and it fell off and it cracked in my car just because I had it parked outside. So, you know, another thing. And then another one was I tried to open up my car with my key and it was frozen so solid that my key snapped in half when I was trying to turn it. My doors were frozen last yep. week, so yep. it's it hasn't adjusted to moving as well. You know, the car still needs time to adjust. Where were you at before you came back up to Pennsylvania? Tulsa, Oklahoma. So, yeah, quite quite a trip home. You couldn't wait until the end of winter to come back? <laughs> I know. I, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, we uh, my mom and I have followed each other back. Um, we, we took everything in just two vehicles. We didn't want to do a U-Haul. So we made it in uh, one day, and it was quite a trip you I couldn't even see out the back of my car there was so much junk everywhere um and I think I was sitting at like a 45 degree angle forward you know but we made it work so we did it well that well that's awesome well let, we should get started with the health and fitness part of the podcast so why don't you give us your backstory and what really inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're at today yeah so um well if we want to start at the very beginning I was always super um, into sports as a kid. I played soccer was my main sport. I did do some cross country and track and field, but um, pretty much soccer all year round club, high school. Um, I was super competitive. Um, when I got into my senior year, I started dealing with a lot of physical issues, uh, especially in my back, a lot of back pain. Um, and then when I went and got it checked out, it uh, turned out that I had degenerative disc disease. So Basically, the um, <clears throat> the discs in my back were breaking down at an accelerated rate. And they told me, they said, when we look at your back, you know, at your x-rays, it, it looks like a 60-year-old woman. So I um, I did had a lot of, you know, I bent over a lot too. Um, but so I had to have two custom back braces made to finish out, you know, the season. And um, they basically said, you know, after high school, this is it, you know, you, you won't be able to play in college, which was, you know, the dream. Everyone wants to play sports in college. Um, I really wanted to play soccer in college. And so um, that really kind of, that was a tough pill to swallow for me. So when I went to college, I stopped everything because of my back. You know, I didn't want to wear the back braces anymore. Um, so I just stopped training, stopped working out, gained that probably freshman 30, not 15. <laughs> it was definitely closer to a 30 for me. Um, and, you know, just got into studying and everything else, didn't really train or honestly didn't even do intramural sports. Um, it was not until after college uh, that I kind of got to the point where I was like, you know, I was like, this is, you know, I was tired of it. Um, and I started CrossFit. And so I basically went from, you know, doing absolutely nothing to what's the most intense thing on my body that I can do, um, you know, and with my back problems, you know, um, started CrossFit. But honestly, it was kind of a miracle. Uh, I started building up my back strength, um, didn't have the pain. And um, not too long after that, probably about six months into 
doing CrossFit. I'd always wanted to compete. My dad loves bodybuilding. He's kind of what got me into it. Um, my family just loves bodybuilding. The sport as a whole, we have such respect for the sport. We love the sport. Um, and so that's kind of when I switched over. I met a trainer in Oklahoma when I moved out there um, and started with him. And that's kind of how I switched into competing. Wow. So I was thinking about trying out CrossFit, but I'm 6'3", so I mean, that would not work out well for me. I'm, I'm a little too tall for that, but how, how was your back when you first started CrossFit? Because the minute you said I started CrossFit, I was like, oh, your back must have really thanked you then. Was it, was it hard at first to get back into the shape of things, or was it something where it was a lot simpler than you thought it would be with your back? It was simpler. I really do honestly feel like it was a mir- it, it was a miracle because um, there's in the natural, there's no way I should be able to do any of the things I'm doing or the things I was doing, especially with CrossFit. Um, the kind of strain it puts on your back just naturally as a sport. Um, there's no reason I should have been able to do, you know, do any of that. And it's so funny is like, whenever I get lean, like my most conditioned part of my body is my back, which is so ironic, because it's the one thing that, you know, I thought was going to stop me from doing, um, you know, fitness. So it's just interesting how that happens. Yeah, that's, I mean, and that's just another thing that, you know, there's so many stories that we hear on here, but I mean, they're always so great. And I think yours is especially, you know, a great one. But when you were getting started in that transition to bodybuilding, what was one thing that, you know, surprised you the most about the preparation in the sport? Because so many people walk into it, you know, not having the proper knowledge, but I think you having that background where you had a family that really enjoyed it. Was it, do you think it was easier for you to sort of get into this lifestyle than someone else just because you did have that background in the family? I do. I think so. I think I had a really good understanding of what all went into it. Um, I also dated a few bodybuilders. So I felt like even though I hadn't competed, I had been in the community for quite some time. It's not a huge community. So, um, you know, once you're kind of get sucked in, uh, you know, I did, I do feel like I had that background knowledge that definitely helped, um, in my first prep. And when you were getting started in the gym, I mean, I always make the analogy of if you were to walk into a gym with a hundred people, there's a hundred different ways as to how those people got into shape, whether it comes down to their diet, their nutrition, how many reps they do, what exercises they do. So many little things add up to that overall package that people end up seeing. What was that experience like for you? Because if you were to walk up to someone and say, Hey, what'd you train for that body part? It looks amazing. What works best for them? 99% of the time isn't going to work as good for you. Um, I think it was just learning my body. Um, you know, I had, I've had a few coaches now having a really good coach who helps you to, you know, you want to get to a point where you learn your own body. Cause a lot of competitors, um, their coaches know their bodies, but they don't know their own bodies, you know? And so I think finding a good coach that helps you, um, facilitate that where it's not just, okay, I send you pictures and you give me critiques, you know, rather having them say, okay, do you look flat? You know, learning how to analyze your own pictures, learning how to analyze your own movements, you know, like when we do this exercise, am I really making that mind muscle connection? Am I feeling it or am I just doing it? You know, so um, kind of learning how, again, just learning your own body is super important. I think it's kind of something that everyone figures out eventually, but you know, just learning on your own body is huge. Well, and you mentioned mind to muscle connection. That's something that I love to talk about because for non-competitors out there, it's usually a foreign subject where you mention mind to muscle and they're like, Oh, that's, I don't know what that is, but it's something that once you pick up, I mean, it changes everything when it comes to growth, when it comes to, you know, so many of the benefits that working out gives you, I really think it helps, but I always pretend that I was born under a rock and I've never heard about it a day in my life. So if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Victoria, what's mind to muscle connection? How would you describe it to them? I think it's so like when you're doing a any particular exercise, whatever it is, you know, say it's doing a lat pull down. So many people, you know, that muscle group, especially people have a hard time activating their lats. And it's, you know, like as you're doing the movement, say it's a lat pull down. Um, you know, it's really like focusing your mind on the muscle and as you contract the muscle feeling like, you know, really thinking about it and feeling about it, you'd be amazed like what a difference it makes. Cause you know, if you're not feeling the exercise, you're one, either you're not hitting it hard enough or two, you're targeting different muscles. Um, so you just really want to work on getting to, you know, it might be a different angle for me for an exercise than, you know, you would do it at a different Uh, different angle because you know even our anatomy is different like even if you look at um like side laterals right you know you look at the pros they don't all do it the same 
some of them do more straight out. Some of them do more at a bent angle because, you know, our shoulders and our anatomy is not all built the same. So what's going to target it for one person may not be what's going to target it for another person. So for a trainer, they don't, they don't know what that is. Only, you know, what, you know, a specific angle is really going to work for you, which is why that muscle, you know, mind muscle connection is so important. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was sort of familiar with it in high school just because I had a guy who helped me with baseball and he did one time where I was doing back and he put his finger like right in the middle of my back just to really get me to focus on that. And I was like, Oh wow, that's, that's completely different where it really helps. So then that's really where I got into it there. But you know, yeah, you know, with mind and muscle and the one thing that with mind and muscle too, is that let's say you're training arms or something like that and you develop a mind and muscle with your arms. That doesn't mean you're going to have it with your legs. It's something where you have to do it for each individual body part. So how long into your journey do you think that you develop that overall mind and muscle connection? Cause it may, let's say it takes you maybe a couple of months to develop like a leg mind and muscle, but then when it comes to training back or shoulders, it might take you even longer, but how long into your journey before you felt that like, Hey, I have an overall really good mind and muscle connection. Honestly, probably not until my third prep. I feel like my first two preps, you know, you really are, you're, you're just absorbing so much. There's so much to this sport that people don't realize um, that, you know, it's like whatever my trainer did, I was just trying to make sure I was doing it, you know, and doing it. But like, you get to a point when you start training more with yourself, you know, where they give you the exercises and you got to push yourself. Sometimes they're not going to be there to push you. Um, and you got to push yourself past that point of failure. You know, it's really, um, figuring that out. I mean, it, it did take time, you know, it's not an overnight thing and that's okay. You know, um, it, it is a journey. It's a journey for everybody. Um, and you know, people will get there. Yeah. And I mean, that's why I always say people our age, if they want to get in shape, I mean, good luck because everyone wants everything now and they want it yesterday where this is the one lifestyle where, you know, it's going to take you some time. But I also love to talk genetics on this podcast because with everyone on social media, I mean, oh my God, I want his arms. I want her abs. I want their back. People just don't understand that you can only be the best version of yourself because, you know, you don't know how that person got to that. We do have some genetic freaks where, I mean, they were just born with a 12 pack basically where you're just like, okay, this is just absolutely ridiculous. But on top of that, whenever someone first gets started working out, they always have that one body part that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much. And they have that one body part that just legs behind it. They have to train to oblivion to get them to catch up. I mean, I'll give you mine first. My back just being that I worked in warehouses all throughout college where you either got a really nice back or you quit. But my legs being 6'3", I mean, they're just absolutely shot where, I mean, I could train them, you know, every day and they wouldn't grow. I could inject pure muscle into my legs and <laughs> yeah. they wouldn't and they wouldn't gain an ounce. But what were those body parts for you when you were getting started? Um... You know, I feel like the funny thing is I feel like my like weaknesses became my strengths because I focused on them so much. Um, probably like anyone who knows me will tell you, I, I love big shoulders and like big delts. Um, and I had no delts when I started bodybuilding. I mean, nothing, you know, I played soccer. So like my, I had no upper body. And so I just hit them constantly. Like after, even after my first show, I was, you know, determined I was going to have the biggest delts. And so that's what I hit. And that's what I worked on. Um, but like you, I'm tall. I'm for a girl, I'm five, almost five, eight. So we've had to work really hard to make my legs grow like really hard. Um, especially in wellness. I mean, we, you know, we hit them hard, even between my third and fourth show, we had about a month and we, we moved up to three times a week and it was just heavy and I felt like I couldn't walk six of the seven days a week, you know, and still it, it's just, it's just really hard with my height to make those fill out versus the girls who are five, four and you know, it's already there. So I think legs has been hard for me to grow. Um, and I feel, but I feel like my upper body has grown much quicker than my legs. Well, now I got to ask any tips for legs because literally I'm willing to take anything on this podcast because I'm just one of those rare people where, you know, I'm going to have to basically train them until, you know, I basically am probably going to end up being in a wheelchair just because I train them so much. But, you know, any tips that you have on what really helped you develop those legs? Honestly, I th just lifting heavy. I think so many girls um, and even competitors where um, my I had a coaching experience where I was constantly told like to not lift heavy. And, you know, they didn't grow until I started lifting heavy. I mean, it's, you know, if you don't feel completely wrecked by legs, in my opinion, you're not doing it right. I'm not saying you have to get to that point every single time, but, you know, it, you really have to, especially with legs, I feel like you got to push yourself to an uncomfortable spot. Um, you know, legs is one of those things where there's a reason why people don't enjoy doing legs. You know, it's because it's hard. It's because it's the most taxing. It's because it's exhausting, but it should be, you know? Um, and not being afraid to do those big, heavy movements, you know, not just air squats and not just those, um, you know, those Instagram exercises you see, like, like 
you know, I like, I don't want to get too critical, but, um, you know, you really got to get to a point where you're just comfortable with lifting heavy. There's nothing wrong. I think a lot of times in the fitness industry, because people want to be relevant and all these things, they try to reinvent the wheel. Like, no, like the, the old school, just lifting heavy, you know, heavy, and it doesn't have to be squats, but, you know, just getting back to lifting heavy, not all these, there's nothing wrong with accessory exercises, but like keyword is accessory, you know, do those in addition to just lifting heavy. No. Yes. Yeah, so many people too. Yeah. They follow those Instagram, you know, accounts where they're just like, Oh, you know, have a five pound dumbbell and do some lunges and stuff like that. And it's like, ah, oh, you know, that's, that really might not work out for you, but it goes into the number one myth that I love to bust on this podcast. And we discussed it briefly before I started recording is that, you know, it's gotten better the last five years due to Instagram, but there are still so many women that have that fear where if they walk into the gym and they eye the dumbbells, you know, they just think the world's going to end. Basically they're like, Oh, I don't, I don't want to touch them. I'm just going to run to the treadmill where, you know, I infer because they had that fear that, you know, they're going to put on, you know, like 50 pounds if they, you know, train once. And it's like, first of all, I wish I had that ego because I'd be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company by now. But second of all, I mean, that is just so not true. But did you ever have that fear when you were getting started? And even if you didn't, I mean, I bet you still hear that, you know, all the time to this day. How do you like to respond to that? I hear it from men just as much as I hear it from women. Like when it comes to dating, I hear it all the time where guys are like, oh, well, I think you look great, but you know, like you better be careful. You don't want to get too big. And I'm like, let me tell you how easy it is to get big, especially as a woman. We don't have the same levels of testosterone. It, we don't build muscle the same. You know, there, there are differences. You know, it's much harder to get bigger um, than even men realize. Uh, I don't think that was ever a fear for me just because I always, you know, just wanted to get bigger. Um, but yeah, no, it's super common. And I find it just as common, um, you know, to be believed with men as women. Which is which is something that we've actually heard on here for the first time, because, yeah, normally it's just associated with women. But, yeah, I have heard men say that, too. But it's just I haven't I haven't heard that many because well, mainly because guys don't like to talk about working out with other guys. It's mainly one of those things where you're just like, oh, hey, how much can you lift? And that's really the only conversation that that really guys. That's why I don't have that many guys on the podcast, because it would literally just be like a five second conversation. I'd be like, oh, end a podcast. Ever hope you enjoyed it. Like, subscribe. Let's go. So. So, yeah, but that's amazing. And yeah, I mean. It's just, yeah, just, just proving that myth. Like I said, it has gotten better. So, you know, hopefully, you know, five years from now, it'll be even more, you know, debunked. But one thing that I like to add on to that, because I think it's something that impacts women, especially a lot more than men. It impacts men too, as well. It's just that confidence boost that working out gives you. I mean, we have heard so many stories on this podcast of women who have been able to, you know, make life changing decisions, maybe become more assertive, or just, it's that one thing that you can take from the gym and use to impact every single aspect of your life. How have you personally taken out work or taken working out and use that to impact your life in a positive way? You know, I think one thing um, that it's been like a goal of mine is uh, one thing I kind of miss about CrossFit as much everyone likes to hate on CrossFit and I get it. It's like definitely an occult, just like bodybuilding can be an occult, but they are a super supportive community. And I think that's something as bodybuilders we could get better at. Um, you do see support to a certain extent, but the thing is, is like as soon as the competitors away, you know, people are like, oh, well. Like they need to work on this. It, like, you know, like their legs were horrible. This was horrible. You know, I hear that kind of stuff all the time. Or um, I get a lot of these backhanded compliments all the time from other competitors, um, which to me is just like an insecurity thing. But I think we could do, you know, we already receive a lot of criticism. So, you know, who gets it more than other competitors? So I think one thing we can work on and, you know, I want to work on is being there for other female competitors who just want support. You know, there's no reason you shouldn't want to help out other competitors, you know, because it's a difficult lifestyle. It's a hard lifestyle. It can be su it can be very isolating. And so like having that support is super um, important. And so that's something I would kind of want to work on is, you know, just being more supportive to each other. No, I, I totally agree with that, too, where it's like, yeah, if you don't have support, this lifestyle becomes basically impossible. I mean, most of the guests that we have on, you know, they have that support of friends and family. So that's nice. And I mean, you having that background with your family is is really nice, too. But, yeah, we've heard so many stories where, I mean, if they don't have that support, it becomes nearly impossible to, to really achieve something in this lifestyle. But on top of all that, I mean... The thing that's talked about a little bit, but it's not talked about as much as it should be is nutrition because so many people, you know, whether it's through TV shows or whatnot, they have that belief where, you know, oh, as long as I work out, you know, I can eat whatever I want. And it's like, well, yeah, if you want to be an average, you know, person, but if you want to go into bodybuilding, good luck with that. And what were some of the bigger nutritional changes that you made when you really started, you know, put on some size and really get into this? I think, um, I think because I competed in bikini and I was used to, um, 
bikini macros, I will say it was a hard adjustment for me, um, you know, moving up into wellness where I got to eat a lot more food. And like we were in prep and I was like, you know, like I felt like, you know, I'm eating too much. I shouldn't be eating this much. And like my coach, you know, kept saying, no, like, just trust me like this is. And so that was actually hard for me was allowing myself to um, kind of eat more because I was so used to like, if I'm not hungry, I feel like, you know, something's <laughs> not right. Um, but that's not true. And like this last prep was our my most successful prep. It's the best I've looked. And it, I was, you know, um, it was the best I've ever been fed during a prep. So I didn't starve. I got tons of refeeds. Um, and so, you know, it's just been a learning process for me. But, um, you know, you really do. If you want to grow, you got to eat, you know, and I love food. So like telling me to eat is not a problem. But, you know, sometimes just on a personal level, you know, it's just taken me a long time to find good balance, which I think I'm finally at a point where, you know, um, even now that I'm into my off season, you know, my coach is like, you know, I don't want you always weighing, which some people weigh constantly and there's nothing wrong with that. But for me, he, you know, it was more of a, I need you to learn to like, you know, ease up a bit, you know, that he, I'm not, he, I'm not saying he would say that for everybody, but he's like, you know, for you personally, I need you to stop weighing so much, you know? So it's something, you know, I've been working on is balance. Um, and just allowing myself to enjoy, you know, when we're having a cheat meal, when we're having a refeed, um, you know, that time with family. So I, I am a firm believer, like food is not just fuel, you know, so like, I hate when people say that because, you know, there's so like food is awesome. Like, at like the heart of it all, I am the biggest foodie. So, you know, there's so many experience, like that's such a limit, you know, limiting assumption to make how many great memories of families and things like that are made over food, you know, or memories of a special occasion, you know, things like that. So there's no reason you can't have both. There's no reason you have to, you know, some of these bodybuilders, that's fine. You know, it's like, if you didn't suffer for it, well, yeah, like it shouldn't be easy, but at the same time, there's no reason you can't enjoy your food during prep, you know? So I'm just, I think just working on balance has been big for me. Well, damn, you got me drooling thinking about Thanksgiving, talking about all those family memories with food and stuff like that. Jeez, I'm going to have to go and get some chicken or something tonight, God, to, to, to sort of get rid of that. But yeah, you, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. Or, I mean, so many people, you know, they just, they're constantly weighing themselves and they're constantly worried about, you know, like their food adjustments where it's, you can take it a little bit easy sometimes. And, you know, there are proper ways to, to do things. And, you know, again, it's a trial and error process where, I mean, it's going to be a lot of trial and error when, especially with the nutrition, because you unless you are the luckiest person on the planet, you find out what works best for your body nutritional wise on your first try, which I mean, there's probably been like one or two people that I've had on the podcast that have had that happen. I mean, it, it, it's going to take a while, but the decision to move into wellness, because for anyone who doesn't know, you know, wellness was the new division that was created. It's, you know, sort of in between bikini and figure, what was your decision or what was behind your decision to transfer into wellness? Cause a lot of times you might hear, I mean, you might, you might've been like a little bit too muscular. You might've been a little too big, but what was your personal reason for deciding, Oh, Hey, wellness sounds like something I, I would like to do. Well, honestly, I found bikini to be a very frustrating category. Um, it was one of those things where, you know, it is such a, it still is, it's such a subjective category. Um, and, you know, all, they all are to an extent, but I think bikini especially, you know, it really depends on what judges are there that day, whether they want a hard look, whether they want a soft look, whether they want more muscular, whether they want you to look more lean, you know, it, it's just one of those things where it was so frustrating because you would put on muscle to let it atrophy off to fit into your category. Um, you know, so I, I was definitely kind of over bikini, but I loved to compete and I wasn't quite ready for, you know, to make the step up to figure. It wasn't a category that necessarily interested me at the time. Um, and I was really, so I was really excited when they brought wellness in this year. Um, and then me and my coach talked and it was, it was an you know, it was a decision we made pretty early on that, you know, this would be better for me, but even now, you know, things change quickly. So next year we're we're contemplating some other decisions Ooh. but i don't want to say anything too soon because nothing's been decided yet well so. when we have her on in a year we'll figure out what what it's all been about but did your training change up at all when it came to you know the gym because if you're you know finally able to you know not have to atrophy as much yeah no um i will say we we were lifting heavier uh, but you know, honestly, it was mostly the diet made all the changes was just eating more, it, it, you know, um, my body was much happier <laughs> with me, you know, we were able to keep on more muscle. Um, and I was able to come in 17 pounds heavier than my last, you know, show. Jeez, wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. And I mean, 
the number one thing that I would have never guessed in a million years when it comes to talking to these competitors is that for so many of them, posing is the hardest thing for them. Would have never guessed it in a million years. It's harder than your nutrition. It's harder than your working out. I mean, I like to compare it now to being a perfect driver where you can be a great driver. You can never be a perfect driver. You can be a great poser. You can never be a perfect poser. It's always ever evolving. What has your personal experience with posing been like? I, I can concur. <laughs> it is a hundred percent the hardest thing for me. Uh, my first show, I didn't, um, pose enough so you know when I was coming into this year I was like okay you know this this time I'm gonna be super prepared you know I'm gonna be as prepared as prepared can be and it's funny is still after the show they were um you know I ended up you know uh talking with the head judge a lot because I had another show in a month and I was like what can I change what do I need to do and he was like honestly you're posing just didn't show off your best features. And the the thing is, is I was super confident. You know, I will say stage presence was night and day. We were super confident and everything else. But he was like, you know, just you need to tweak this. You need to tweak this. And it's amazing how, you know, I it just totally changed, you know, how I looked on stage one month later just because of, you know, small little changes. So many times people just don't know you know, they have amazing physiques, but if you don't know how to show it off, show it off well, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Um, cause you know, what matters is how you show it off and, you know, or if you don't have a suit that properly shows, you know, your best features. So, um, yeah, posing is huge. Posing is definitely the hardest thing for me for, even with as much as I practice, you know, it's still the biggest challenge. You know, I don't look forward to posing practice. Um, I kind of worked it in where, you know, rather than doing it after, I, I would pose after um, training sessions just because I feel like I'm already gassed. It's a good time to just push myself and pose a little bit. But on my off rest days of training, that's when I would go to the gym and spend like a half hour, 45 minutes. Whereas, okay, I'm replacing time because I, I like to always be doing something. I don't enjoy rest days that much. So I was like, okay, I'm going to force myself to go train and pose on my rest days. And that made a big difference. Well, and especially when it comes to you know, for women in posing, one thing that we hear is, you know, the hardest thing for a lot of women is learning to flare those lats because that's one thing that's, you know, and, in, and for men too, but for, since I have a lot of women on the podcast, you know, that's one thing that they say a lot. What was that like for you sort of developing that? Because for some women, it takes years for them to really get those lats to be able to flare. I will say for bikini and wellness, it's not necessarily um, as big of a deal. Um, just because, you know, um, our back, besides, you know, you wanting to, uh, see, you know, see the curves on the side, um, you know, we don't get, we don't get graded on it. So we don't get to move our hair, uh, depending on the show. Um, but so for me, it was probably, I have a lot of tightness in my hips and things like that. Um, and you know, bikini and even wellness, it's, it's just a lot of kind of contorting your body. So you're really twisting your upper half and your lower half. And it almost looks like you took your body and you want, you know, like that, you know, so it, it's just, um, it's more of like a contortion game. I will say I'm not the most flexible. So it's something that, you know, um, working on mobility is something, you know, that's really helpful. You're talking to a guy who would have got the presidential fitness thing in, 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 in elementary school. Had he been able to do that extension thing that they have you do where you reach for the thing and see how far you can push it. Yeah, at least flexible person on the planet. I mean, I could touch my toes probably when I was 10, but then that was like the last time I could because then I started to really grow. But yeah, so that's I, I totally understand you on the flexibility part. And I ask that because for some competitions, so I've had some guests that are wellness competitors from like uh, Brazil, Australia. They actually have them do a lat spread. So the posing is different for countries. So I think you're only like the second U.S. guest. So. That's something that we learn, you know, new all the time that they don't really have to do that lat spread. But yeah, I mean, it's just it's it, so it, important to know how to oh, do it. It's just not um, yeah. something that I focus on as yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Abs absolutely. But what is your relationship like wearing those damn high heels? Because we hear so many times that, you know, that's that's one of the main reasons why we have a lot of figure girls that move into physique because they're like, OK, I don't have to wear those heels anymore. And I, yeah, and I have to say, I, I really wish I didn't have to. I mean, at five eight, you know, I never wore heels because I'm already tall. So with my heels on, I'm six one on stage. And you know, it's funny at the Oklahoma show because wellness is a new category. They didn't have divisions based on height. So you know, I was standing next to a girl who was like five five with her heels on, and I was six one. And if you look at the stage shots, I like look like Amazon woman. You know, I just it just looks so ridiculous because I'm so much taller. Um, but I, I've gotten better. It definitely took a lot of practice. It took finding the right shoes, um, you know, investing in the money because, you know, it took a few pairs to find the ones that were actually comfortable enough. Uh, but yeah, that, that was a challenge. That was not, 
something I'm naturally good at. So that's taken a lot of practice. We had one guest on who was six, two without the high heels and she was a figure competitor. So she was six, seven with those things on. And I was like, okay, yeah, you're a monster. Then basically <laughs> you're a giant on that stage. So that would be like me. I mean, I'd be like six, eight, six, nine, if I had to wear those things. So yeah, good, a good thing that I, that I don't do that. But yeah, I always say like, isn't it hard enough on the competitors enough that you got to make them wear the high heels. It's like, I would pay, they should do that for the guys too. And that would break the internet, you know, seeing those bodybuilders, those guys <laughs> yeah. go out there on those, on those high heels. But what is that feeling like for you when you get to walk up on that stage and show off, you know, all that hard work that you've worked months upon months on? Because for so many people, they don't understand that for bodybuilding, it's different than all these other sports. Like for baseball, I'd go on the mountain, you know, like 30 times a year. You know, I'd be able to experience that multiple times. But for bodybuilding, it may be once or twice or maybe even three times a year that you get to experience that. So what is that like when, you know, really all that hard work really adds into, you know, a handful of moments at best? You know, I feel like my first show or even maybe my first two, I felt kind of like deer in the headlights kind of thing where it was so overwhelming, um, you know, and as much as you try to prepare for it, there's just things you can't prepare for until the day of the show. You know, my uh, tan turned green like an hour and a half before. And so they were re-scrubbing me down and re and then I had like 20 minutes and I almost missed uh walkouts for the pittsburgh show because i got there later because they said you'll sit all day so don't show up right away so you'll be more refreshed and then i had five minutes to pump up but i will say um you know it's I, i've gone to the point where you know day of the show you've put in all the work right so there's nothing at this point you can change you know so you know really just enjoy yourself because it, it shows on stage and the judges can see if you're enjoying yourself on stage and, or they can see if you're just timid and, you know, like, um, they see all that. So, you know, if, if you look like you're enjoying yourself, it makes such a difference. And I noticed even in my stage shots, you know, at my most recent show, I just look so much happier. You know, my smile was so much more genuine rather than feeling like forced, you know, like I needed Vaseline to, you know, to keep that smile on. Um, but you know, just really enjoying yourself, you know, um, you know, I wanted to make it a really good experience too with my family because it's something I really, you know, appreciate their support. And like, you know, so if you're miserable the whole time and they're not enjoying it, you know, like, what's the point, you know? So the whole point is for them to come see you and enjoy it. You know, I try to make it just a really good experience for everybody. Um, you know, it is about you, but at the same time, you know, it, it does take a small army, right, to compete. You have a posing coach, you have your actual coach, you know, you may have someone else who trains you and then all that other stuff. So it does take a small team. Um, so just enjoying myself has been the biggest thing. And that's such an important thing too, because I mean, if you're not enjoying it, then it's like, I feel the, so sorry for you because you put in all that work to not enjoy it. Where it's like, yeah, if I ever looked like that, like stage look now, I've looked good in the past. Don't get me wrong, but I've never looked stage good. We're literally, you know, I would basically just walk around naked then the whole time. If I ever got to that look, <laughs> where I'd just be like, everyone look at this, you know, but you know, that's, that's one of the reasons too, why I don't compete, you know, that's for the, for the safety of the public, I, I should say. But, um, another myth and stereotype that I love to bust on this podcast is that, you know, so many people do not understand that that look that you present on stage. That is not a sustainable look. You're not going to be able to look like that 365 days out of the year. And that's one thing that I think there's shows like Biggest Loser where people go on it and they lose hundreds of pounds and sometimes they're able to keep it off. I have to quote sometimes because, yeah, it has shown that most of them gain the weight back. But people watch shows like that and I think they just assume like with bodybuilding because they have limited knowledge of the sport. Oh, they train just as hard, if not harder, as those people on Biggest Loser. They should be able to, you know, keep that look that they present on stage, but they don't realize that you've manipulated your body and you've dieted down, you've, you know, retained, you've got water retention, just all that stuff that, that plays into this. What was that like when you first realized that, you know, like, hey, all this hard work that I put into this look, you know, it's not going to be sustainable. And has that gotten easier for you to accept as your career has gone on? Yeah, it definitely has. You know, once you get to a point of acceptance that, you know, you're going to have to, you know, gain some weight to if you want to put on size you know you see people there are people who um stay not quite stage lean but they stay ripped year round right but then you see them compete and they're never any bigger you know the, like they have such minute changes and it's like to me and their a, careers usually don't last as long too it's true it's true because of you know the hell it's not sustainable um you know like you probably hear this a lot i don't i'm just very open about it you know a lot of women lose like their menstrual cycles because their body fat's too low um and the thing is is that's not sustainable for long periods of time you know you have to get up to a point where you know you have menstrual cycle again and things like that um but no it, it has gotten easier you know i don't mind being soft in the off season now you know it's you know, I love food so much. I look forward to off season. So, you know, I look forward to growing. Um, and you have to be in a surplus if you're, if the muscles are going to grow, you just have to. So, especially if you, you know, 
you know, if you want to come on, you know, significantly heavier, um, you know, I had a pretty bad rebound my, my, after my first show, it, it was not good. Um, but I have to say, you know, because I rebounded and because I got to, you know, healthier levels, like that's, if I had stayed super strict, I don't know if I would have come in as heavier, you know, as heavier as I did. I came in 17 pounds heavier in two years. That's huge for a woman. Um, and so, it, you know, if I was super strict, that, that never would have happened. Not saying that, you know, bad rebounds are a good thing either. There, it's definitely about balance. But um, it has gotten a lot easier for me where, you know, it, it's a hard pill to swallow those first few weeks because, you know, you've seen yourself so lean for, you know, it's, you know the six pack starts to like gets a little blurrier and things like that. And you're like, oh, this is kind of, it's kind of a hard pill to swallow at first, but, um, no, it, it's, I've gotten comfortable with it at this point. Well, the moment that you mentioned mental struggles, I just shut down because I'm like, I'm just going to nod, nod your head, pretend like, you know what they're talking about and understand what that's like. And you know, yeah, you know, yeah, it must, it must be bad, but no, it was funny. Cause I had a hormone specialist on the podcast and I told her first off, I was like, for the longest time, I didn't even think that guys had hormones. Like whenever people would be like, Oh, you should get your hormones checked out. I was like, Oh, isn't that just like a girl thing that they like go and get their home. And they're like, Oh no, you have hormones too. And I was like, Oh, Okay. I, I did. I was not aware of that. So yeah, that really, that really brightened things up. But yeah, just the, that's why I like having women on too. Cause the stuff that they have to go through as opposed to the men, when it comes to hormones and everything that goes into this, I mean, it is a lot more difficult in my opinion. And I think in anyone's opinion that really follows both sides of the sport, you know, so that's, that, that's just so great as well. But you mentioned abs and I was going to say, if there's one body part that I was going to ask how she got to look, the look, the way that they look is abs. Cause she has great abs for anyone. I'll leave, I'll show some pictures from her Instagram page, but is it just something that was just genetically blessed to you or is it something that you work hard on? What is your relationship like with abs? Because, you know, being a guy, especially, you know, since hopefully by the time summer comes around, we'll be, a lot of people will be vaccinated. So hopefully beach season will be a thing. You know, what are some ab things that you like to do? Um, honestly, I, like I like to tell people, I, I didn't always have great abs. I was always like tones, but you can, there wasn't def definition. Um, like when I was lean, you, it would, I would just look tones, but there was definitely no definition there. Um, and I will say, I, a lot of people do all these, I talk about accessory exercises and that never did it. Honestly, just training really heavy, learning to train heavy is, you know, how, um, they've developed over time. Now I still do accessory exercises, but I tell people, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, push some heavy weights if you really want to put some size on them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's one thing that a lot of people, I mean, a lot of guys and a lot of newbies still have that belief that, you know, Oh, I'll just do like a thousand crunches a day or something like that. Or do it's like, yeah, you're going to build like really big obliques then, but you know, the abs might not really come in as much. That's, I fell victim to that when I was, you know, 19 years old where I was like, yeah, I'll just do like 600 crunches a day. And you know, it, it, it worked a little bit, but you know, it, it really, you got like a four pack basically then you didn't really get rid of that, that little, that little final six pack thing. So yeah, it's a, it's a never ending work, but one and obviously just being lean too. Yeah. I mean, ultimately we know like abs are made in the kitchen and it's true. It's, you know, you have to get your body fat levels low enough because most people have abs are just hidden but. Um, unless you're one of those crossfitters where you have like that pregnant six pack where like your yeah. butt your belly's like 10 inches out and they're like still have abs and i was like how is that like what what are you doing come on like annie thor's daughter and some of those people like she was pr she was like eight months pregnant and she still had, like a little bit of abs and i was like what, what the hell what are you doing like it's yeah, yeah so love their thick abs I yeah love it. it's yeah that's that that's insane but one last body part that i was going to ask you about because the moment that you said that shoulders were the thing that took off for you about 300 of my female guests started crying out ask her how she got those shoulders because that is the number one thing when i ask what's one body part that really took forever shoulders is the number one thing where most women struggle with that so i mean i would get you know i'll probably get about 10 messages if i don't ask you that so what is what did you do for shoulders because you know that's one thing especially for women and for men too but i think for women especially that is like the holy grail of like something that they always want to get to look nice yeah um i say hitting it multiple times a week i usually hit i hit them heavy twice a week and like i said it, it was it was a weakness for me and and i just i wanted huge shoulders like i just wanted to be known for my shoulders and i don't believe i'm quite there yet but i'm working on it um i always lose some size during prep so i love off season because i feel like you know they just always get much bigger but um twice a week I, I and like focusing on them you know and again just lifting heavy and targeting all the different aspects you know some exercises are gonna you know more hit your front delts some are gonna more focus on you know your sides and then you know don't forget about the rears too i think sometimes we forget about the rear delts but um you know doing exercises to hit you know all three areas um but yeah i think just hitting them you know hitting them like they're, you know, a leg day, you know, I think so many times people just, just like sometimes 
biceps and things for girls, like they, they don't give them enough attention. I, if you give them enough attention, they'll grow. Well, you brought them up because, you know, biceps for guys, that's the number one thing. Do you train right. them at all? Because for so many figure competitors that I've had on, I'm shocked when they say, no, I don't train them at all. And I was like, oh God, that's just ridiculous. But are you one of those that don't train them at all? Or do you, do you have a training day for them? Or is, or is it more of like an accessory thing for you? I do train biceps. I don't train them um, as much as, you know, the figure competitors would and things like that. Or you said some of them don't even train them. I, I do still train them. We hit everything. You know, I make sure I hit every, you know, body group. You know, because over time, you, you do start to see a difference if, if you don't train everything to an, in a degree. And sometimes figure competitors probably don't need to because, you know, they get enough in compound exercises. Or, you know, even in their back day, you know, the compound exercises, you know, su suffice. They're still hitting the bicep. But, um, no, I do like to do to isolate it. I just don't give it its own day. You know, I'll throw it in with, on back day as well. But I don't give biceps its own day. It just doesn't need it for my category. Well, well yeah, when, it's, when I say, like, some of them don't train at all, what I mean is, like they do those accessory things where during a back day, they said they'll feel enough of a pump. And, you know, that's one of those things where being a guy, I look at that and I was like, oh my God, if only, if only that were with me too, where I didn't have to, you know, train them, you know, like twice a week, just all just doing curls all day and doing all these other variants and stuff. But I'm glad that you mentioned the three parts of the shoulder. Cause most people, they just believe that the shoulder is just one big thing where they're like, oh, I'm just training the one part. It's like, no, there's three parts to it where you gotta, but then again, that's why bodybuilders are great examples of it. Cause they're the one people where you can actually see the three different spots of the shoulder. Whereas everyone else, you know, they have that one that everyone just thinks that that's the one part of the shoulder. But, um, yeah. And you mentioned too, like, I always like to say this with bodybuilders, especially females too, where like, if you were to walk out in public dressed the way you are right now, first of all, don't do that because it's cold out there. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to freeze. But if you were, I mean, you become sort of like a mini celebrity because everyone's staring just because it's human nature. When they see something that's not of the normal sort of be like, Oh, that's interesting. What has that been like for you sort of, you know, getting adjusted to that? And has it been an easy journey for you to sort of get used to the fact that, I mean, you are going to draw a lot of people's attentions if you're out in public and you're not, you know, dressed in 10 layers. Yeah, no, I've definitely gotten used to it, at least in the gym aspect. Um, I think the funny thing is when I first was doing it, like the first year or two, because in, you know, bikini, you're so small, like, especially with normal clothes on, when you said you competed in things, people were like, oh, really? And you're like, yeah, I do. I swear, <laughs> you know, like, but I'm tiny, you know, you look so tiny with clothes on. And even now, um, if they're not form fitting, it's like, I just look pretty tiny. Um, but no, I think you just get used to it, especially at the gym, you know, um, I'm so focused now on my training that it's like, you know, I think when I first started lifting and things like I was so, I didn't quite have that confidence. And so I spent more time like, you know, like looking at other people, I guess. But at this point, it's just like, unless someone comes up and talks to me, I have, I really don't even know who's there, you know, cause I'm just, I'm just so focused on this is, you know. I got to get this train this done. You know, I want to really effectively, you know, exhaust the muscle and I'm just too focused on training that I don't really notice. Well, and two things as well. I mean, cardio is the bane of my existence. I hate it more than life itself. You know, I just, Oh my God, just even saying that is making me dread it. Now, when I say cardio, I mean like actually going on runs because I can walk, you know, on a treadmill for like five hours a day and that I'd be fine with that. But when it comes to the actual running, but what is your relationship with cardio? Like, cause I know that you had that experience in soccer where I was like, so one reason I never played soccer is because like, I don't like to run. That's why I was a pitcher. It's the perfect position where, you know, you have to train your legs a lot, but you know, Hey, you just have to walk out to the mound. That's the only thing you have to do really. And that's, and you're about done. But what has your relationship with cardio been like? I don't hate it as much as some of my competitor friends. Some of them, you know, absolutely despise it. But I will say like, I've like, I'm so passionate about lifting that it's like, to me, I, I don't want to like be spending time, you know, on, on, you know, a Stairmaster or, you know, the treadmill. Like I just want to be lifting. So, um, it's definitely like a necessary evil during prep, but, um, you know, especially this last prep, because I'm definitely an ectomorph. When I start losing, I lose pretty quickly. Um, so we didn't have to push like tons of cardio compared to what some people uh, push. So, you know, it never got to the point where I was just like absolutely dreading it every morning. Um, I enjoy fasted cardio. It makes me feel tighter um, and things like that. So I, I don't hate it. I will say my coach was like, no more cardio. <laughs> like now that we're in off season and I'm like, you don't have to tell me twice. Like it's really, I don't love it that much, but um, you know, just minimal, you know, just for cardiovascular reasons. But um, yeah, I, I don't hate it. You know, I Stairmaster does get old. If you can change it up, you know, I think that's good. But, um, you know, it's good for you. 
absolutely. And you know, Hey, I always, I always tell the story if I had an ex girlfriend who used to run marathons and she always said, Oh, Hey Ryan, you want to go out for a run? No simplest answer ever. And I even told her, I was like, the only time you're ever going to see me run, you have to chase me with a knife. That's like the only time you're really ever going to ever going to see me get up and run. So, you know, that just be prepared for that. But yeah, so, but I mean, the most important thing when it comes to recovery, and it might be the most important thing just overall in your life is sleep. It's never talked about on Instagram, never talked about, I mean, not, I mean, I just cannot imagine how many times people have, you know, fallen into that where, and if anyone says it's not that important, I always tell them this, pull an all nighter and then go and work out and see how you do. I tried that in college twice and I lasted halfway through the workout and I could only lift about, you know, like 75% of what I'd normally do. And I was like, okay, this is BS. I'm going to go back and, you know, fall asleep. But what does your sleep schedule look like? Because, you know, we had people that have worked nights. We've had people that, you know, just have a wide variety of sleep schedules. I'm a crazy night owl where I was in bed at midnight last night, which is the earliest I've been in like a month. Normally I'm like at like two or 3 a.m. But what does your sleep schedule look like? And are there any, is there anything that you do to, you know, help with that? Because especially in this day and age with technology, I find that people are having such a more difficult time falling asleep. Yeah, I, I will say I'm a huge advocate of sleep. Um, I have my bachelor's in neuroscience. And so we've gone through, I mean, I can send you, there are still people who are convinced that like, you don't need a lot of sleep. Now, that being said, there are individuals who function at a higher level on less sleep. Um, but the body needs sleep and especially for muscle growth and recovery. Um, and as much, you know, you're, you're putting under extreme stress constantly, especially during prep that, you know, that recovery is so important. So I really do aim for eight hours a night, um, especially during prep, but overall, I'm someone who does need a solid eight hours to, I've just learned my body that that's what I need. Um, so, you know, I used to be a natural night out too. It was something I had to force myself to start going to bed earlier because I had to be up for fasted cardio. Um, and if I didn't get to bed, you know, and this sounds so early, but like, I, honestly, during prep, I got, to, I went to bed at like nine, um, or nine 30. I was like in bed, uh, maybe fall asleep by 10 at the latest, but, um, I had, you know, to give myself enough time to get to the gym in the morning before work, um, you know, and you're eating so many times a day, you know, so to prep all my food for the day, um, you know, I, I think just working on, you know, sometimes it may be a day or two of just being exhausted, but just kind of putting yourself to bed earlier. And like, I know this is everyone says this, but like turning off the screens at a certain point, you know, because that just helps stimulate the brain. Um, there is a reason they tell you that and it does make a difference. 100%. And I mean, I, I always tell people who always ask me, it's like, how can you stay up that late, you know, get up at like 11 or noon? And well, first of all, it's the pandemic. But I always say I'm making up for all those times when I was younger, like in high school, when our classes started at 750. And I had to get up at, you know, like 630, 645. And so I'm, I'm making up for it, you know, but it's just just, yeah, I, I mean, sleep is just, I mean, I, so I'm actually, as soon as we're done talking, I'm going to send you the podcast. I had the number one sleep specialist on the planet on for one of my earlier podcasts. He called all the way from Oxford. And first of all, he had one of those British accents where you felt like you gained 10 IQ points just from talking to him where I was like, oh my God, you're going to talk the entire time. And I'm going to listen. Like you're going to say, but no, he was great. So I'll actually, I'll send you that. But now we get into, you know, the most important part of the podcast, I think for recent events is the coronavirus, because it's been one thing that's impacted our lives in more ways than we could have ever imagined. I mean, I can remember when I first started having the coronavirus pop up and, you know, I had guests on, they're like, oh yeah, two weeks, it'll be fine. I had a nurse on, she's like, yeah, a month probably. And then it should do a thing that's like nine months later. And then we're here, here we're at right now. But what has your experience been like during this pandemic being that, I mean, you're a bodybuilder too. So, I mean, working out basically is your drug. So, you know, you, a lot of times when the gyms were closed, I mean, it's, it's, it became a scary place for a lot of bodybuilders. Yeah, I moved home and because things are more open um, in Oklahoma, it's just different out there. Um, I came home and like not even a week later, you know, Governor Wolf was like, the gyms are closing. So um, I immediately found an underground gym that I could go to because, you know, I just I mean, I'm in I'm in a not so much right now, but you know, I was right in the beginning of my reverse, which is such a crucial time for competitors. You really need that consistency, um, especially as hormone levels and different things level out, you know, you got to keep, you know, you, you can't manipulate too many factors at once. So you, you got to be able to train. So, you know, I was panicking a little bit. Um, I will say it's been a challenging year, just like it has been for everybody, especially with training. Um, lockdown was not easy for me back in March and things when everything shut down. Um, I'm a very much like all or nothing person. So when you take away the gym from me, it took away um, my drive to eat well and all those different things. So um, I did not cope with it well. It was just like a lot of people, I think it was really tough. But I will say as soon as, you know, things started to normalize to 
normalize, um, you know, as best they can. I was just so ready to go because, you know, I was I had gained some, you know, COVID weight and all that. And um, I was like, you know, there's so many question marks right now, so many question marks. But, you know, the bodybuilding is something I can control and something that, you know, is stable in my life. And so uh, I was just, you know, so blessed that, you know, even if, you know, we weren't even sure if the shows were going to go on. But, you know, I was going to go into prep either way because, you know, it it really saved me this year. I mean, it really made such a difference in my mental health, um, obviously my physical health, but mental health especially. You know, I, I love that discipline. I need that structure. And, and that's what it gives me. Well, and thank God you're not in Minnesota because the gyms got shut down again. So they've been shut down from November till now it's now they're saying late January. So yeah, luckily I, so I had to move back in with my parents. So luckily they have a nice setup downstairs. So, you know, that's, that's, I'm, I'm able to, you know, stay in shape, but yeah, it's just a struggle. And you mentioned COVID weight. I'm the when we're talking about genetics, I'm so unlucky where every pound of fat that I get goes to either my belly or my chin. I don't care what I could say. I could be, you know, like in an average body weight and it looks like I'm obese for my, that's why I grew out a muscle. That's why I grew out a beard. So until I lose, until I lose that COVID weight, you know, then it, it helps hide sort of your, your fat face. We're literally, yeah, I go like this and I look like Kevin from the office and, I, and I'm six, three and I only weigh 210 pounds. So, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, but yeah, that's, it's just what a time that we've been in. And, I love how gyms have also sort of become like speakeasies now where, I mean, it's whoever, you know, and you like, you got to, you know, sneak in there and stuff. So yeah, it's, I, I found that fascinating, but for someone who's, you know, maybe looking to get started to get in shape, I mean, every, let's be honest, everyone wants to get in better shape. It's just that so many people lack that knowledge on how to do it, which is what holds them back. If someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, Victoria, I just really want to get in shape. What would be the best piece of advice that you give for them just to get started? Because I find for so many people, once they get started, it becomes so much easier to continue. I would say pick one thing at a time. I think so many times when people say I want to get in shape, they try to like take on too many things at once. You know, you see that with like New Year's resolutions, you know, people, I'm going to drink a gallon and a half of water a day and I'm going to eat this way and I'm going to train six days, you know, and it's just so much at once that, um, you know, I read, I don't know where I learned this, but that it took like 40 days to create a habit. Um, and so, you know, trying to, you gonna are you gonna follow everything exactly for forty days? I mean that that's such an unrealistic. When you look at it from that perspective, that's such a hard challenge, you know. To so pick one thing at a time and just make small small changes. Like it doesn't have to be overnight, you know. Like I I think drinking water is really important, and that hasn't been an easy thing for me to do. Like a gallon and a half during prep, you know, every day. Um, I had to work, you know, work up to drinking more water, you know, or you know making again making small changes it doesn't have to be a complete change in your diet over you know overnight um you know i would say maybe stay away from all the fad diets and things like that you know just finding balance you know eating i like that i love the 80 20 rule you know eat, eat clean 80 percent of the time 20 percent of the time enjoy yourself so you don't feel deprived so you don't binge you know um but yeah small changes you know i think that makes a big difference I had one friend who told me that she was going on a liquid diet and I was like, Oh God, it's like, stop. What are you doing? Like, and she did it for like a week and then she's like, yeah, you're right. That was stupid. So yeah, everyone, yeah, those fad diets and every single day there seems to be like 10 of them that, that are come up with. But the final two questions that I ask, you know, every guest before we wrap things up is, you know, if someone were to walk up to you and say, Victoria, we made the decision. You can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. You had the all knowing power to change one thing about the sport. What would it be? Mm, that is, that's, that's a loaded question. I know but, we saved the uh, good, we saved the golden ones for the end. <laughs> I know. I would say to that, you know, we work on being more inclusive, um, and just more supportive. Uh, I, I, I get, you know, it's, we're all competitive, like, you know, and we, and so that competition is, I love competition. There should be competition. There should be a first place, a second place. I'm all for competition. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I think, you know, something we could work on is being more supportive of each other um that's something that i think you know we could change for the better absolutely and i i i think that a lot of it is for but yeah it just depends on you know a lot of things but i mean it, well except for guy by being guy by being they don't even care about each other. i mean they'll rip each other's throat up but that's you know that's the difference between you know guys and girls when it comes to sports and stuff like that where it's like i'm not looking to make friends here i'm looking to kick ass basically it's like the mentality that they have there but you know yeah but that's the, that's something that i oh yeah there's a lot I think especially with the women, I feel like there's a lot of girls who feel like they want to, you know, make changes. And, you know, um, I just think we should be there for 
for them, especially people, you know, there's everyone's on a different point in their journey. So, um, and especially being that, I mean, you all have gone through this suffering together. I mean, you should be bonded by that alone. Like when it comes to preps and stuff. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And, you know, again, I say this without a lack of hindsight, if we were to talk to you a year from today, where'd you like to be at now? Again, if I had to talk to you a year ago, uh, today and then asked you where would you like to be at a year from today if you would have predicted a global pandemic and everything that's gone down you know i would have bet my entire life savings against it so again you guys we do not have hindsight in this who knows we could be talking a year from today and there could be gunshots in the background and there could be a huge fire in the background who knows what the world's going to be like a year from now but in an ideal world where would you like to be at a year from today when it comes to your bodybuilding when it just comes to your overall life what are some goals that you'd like to have achieved I mean, beyond, you know, I think some of it, so much of it, you know, comes down to aesthetics, but, um, I really, I'm really just passionate about lifting too. So for me, you know, I want to be a stronger, you know, version of myself, um, whatever that looks like. And hopefully that means bigger in size, but also just, just being stronger, um, on the strength aspect of it. But, um, yeah, I, I think that's it. What is one area that you're hoping to improve the most on if we're talking here from today? I still, I still want to keep working on my shoulders. Um, I think, well, that... I might have to get a bigger camera then who knows. It might be one of those things. I've had some of these bodybuilders on like actual, like female bodybuilders that compete in the bodybuilding division. Yeah. It's like, they take up so much of the screen that I, I can't even have them do anything. If they're like, if they're like, Oh, I do a lat spread. I was like, don't do a lat spread on the camera. Cause I can't even see it. Like you just, you take up like, like, you know, like half the screen. So. Well, and it's hard to just pick one body part. Cause so much, you know, everything needs improvement. You know, we can always improve and I need, you know, um, I definitely want to put on a good bit more size. So, um, you know, continue to grow the legs, but especially the upper body, I'm definitely trying to grow, um, you know, a much wider back. So working on that as well. That That's awesome. And is there anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up? No, I, I will just say, um, yeah, I'd like to just give a shout out to my coach this past season, um, Scott Emerson. He, we had never worked together before. Um, and we, we started together 12 weeks out from our the first show so he did not have a lot of time to learn my body and you know in 12 weeks it, I was pretty amazed what we did um and he's just been awesome as far as, as far as helping me find balance and uh learn my body and he's he's just been an awesome coach yeah that that's amazing and is there anything else that you'd like to say before we wrap things up any other messages no just thank you for having me on I really appreciate it I appreciate your time and you know wanting to chat with me and I enjoy it absolutely i mean i love having guests come on and share their stories and everyone go and check her out on instagram i'll leave a link down below and you know buyer beware you will get inspired to get off that couch and stop eating those twinkies you know and, and get in shape but again victoria we cannot thank you enough for coming on and sharing your journey and we wish you nothing but the best and we look forward to having you on a year from now just to see how much change has happened thank you ryan i appreciate it absolutely well again you guys this is ryan johnson dd on the spot signing out have a great day everyone